Hello everybody, it is an absolute delight to welcome friends old and new to launch a new initiative of Salzburg Global Seminar, Designs on the Future, and its hallmarks are being open, celebrating our radical roots, and celebrating as well the unrivaled diversity of our fellowship. At this moment of converging crises in the world, uh, it's good to remember Salzburg Global's own radical founding vision in 1947, as the world emerged from the Second World War, three young people with the idea of bridging divides to create the Marshall Plan of the Mind. Uh, 75 years ago, or almost, we've had global impact from the heart of Austria, with some 38,000 fellows from nearly 180 countries coming together. That mission to challenge current and future leaders to shape a better world is so critically needed now, We've had a deep commitment over the years to rising young leaders. And that is so important today as we look at a generational divide of terrifying proportions. We see this new decade as a call to action to reimagine systems, values, and leadership. How can we act smarter and faster to uh, achieve more equitable and sustainable societies? And how can we drive such changes in a world where the risks are rising and trust is at an all-time low? Our launch topic for Designs on the Future is horribly timely. In fact, one of our fellows, a diplomat, tweeted, this is a nasty but necessary question. Globally, there are more democracies than ever, and yet democracies worldwide are facing complex and systemic risks. We're seeing economic and social and racial divisions driving polarization, the media more partisan than ever, and gaps in credibility widening between people and power, with authority in some countries beyond the traditional checks and balances. Uh, participation is an absolutely foundational uh, component of democracy, and yet participation is dwindling. So this question, is so topical 98 days out from the US election. But it goes much, much deeper than a single country or a single set of crises. Unless we can revitalize a shared vision and values, how are we as human communities going to forge stronger and more inclusive societies and economies? So we've got some tough questions ahead of us. And to help us dig deep, we have five extraordinary Salzburg Global Fellows who are working on the front line at local to global levels. In their own ways, they are leaders and disruptors from different geographies, generations, and sectors. First, uh, we are so honored today to welcome back Stacey Abrams. Stacey's bio is really a series of firsts. She's a horizon buster, if ever there was one. An entrepreneur, an author, a lawyer, a politician, at the very heart of America's current political storms. Stacey was the first major party black woman nominee for governor in Georgia in 2018. She increased youth participation by 139%, tripled the turnout amongst Latinos and Asian Americans, and took white participation for Democrats to the highest ever percentage in a generation. She is perhaps <clears throat> America's best known activist combating voter suppression and champ campaigning for voting rights. Salzburg Global is proud to have a long history with Stacey. You heard me mention the importance of young leaders and people from unexpected backgrounds leading change. Stacey became a fellow at the age of 24 when she attended a program on youth and civic participation, models for engagement, and then returned for our program on US-Asia relations in 2002. The program on youth and civic participation was supported by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, which itself has been a great supporter of Salzburg Global throughout the long arc of our history. And the Kellogg Foundation itself has intentionally invested in younger leaders earlier in their careers and opened opportunities for international exposure, so crit critical to many young Americans. For Stacey herself, it was the first time she had had the chance to go abroad. Now, as we move on to Will Dobson's bio, I just call to attention Stacey's own recent book, <clears throat> Our Time Is Now, Power, Purpose, and the Fight for a Fair America. 
Will Dobson is an old friend of Stacy's, and I think they have conspired because they just told me they've each got each other's books prominently on the bookshelves that you see behind them in these images. Will is the co-editor of the Journal for Democracy. He's the former chief international editor at National Public Radio and a distinguished editor and journalist in his own right with huge experience across Asia and the Middle East. Will has focused a lot on the rise of modern authoritarianism, writing the book, The Dictator's Learning Curve, Inside the Global Battle for Democracy. He's also many times a Salzburg fair, Global Fellow, but what you may not know is that back in 1994, he was one of our interns. I'm reminded of Hotel California. You can, you can check out, but never leave. Now turning to our provocateurs, three very different and diverse Salzburg Global Fellows. Chloe Moore is an award-winning social entrepreneur, humanitarian and sociologist. She's founded Next Memphis to advance agency and equity by investing $32 million in early childhood education, and Forbes chose her as one of the 30 under 30. We're very proud to have Chloe in our global network of young cultural innovators, and to honor the city of Memphis as one of our founding city hubs for civic activism and creative economies. Henry Leung is a very unlikely combination of an award-winning poet and a budding lawyer. He authored a volume called The Goddess of Democracy, which made him a finalist for the 2018 Pen America Literary Awards, but it was his direct experience on the ground of Hong Kong's umbrella movement that prompted him to take up law, and he was then selected to be one of Salzburg Global's Cutler Fellows in international law. And last but certainly not least, we have Maria Farrell, um, who an Irish uh, Renaissance woman with a distinguished career that straddles technology policy and governance, but where her own journey to focus more on the future of politics and collective action has taken her towards science fiction to imagine new technological and political futures. Like Stacey, Maria is one of six children. She reckons that being, what, being a middle child forces you to become a politician. And she has been a fellow of our work on strengthening independent media uh, and also on doubling down on democracy. So without more ado, um, we're going to move into a first set of conversations with Stacy. And Stacy, uh, we've, we took this provocative title of has democracy become a spectator sport? Because we wanted to think first about the whole issue of participation and our individual and collective responsibilities. With the malaise of democracy, spectatorship can take many forms. Uh, duly elected politicians turning a blind eye. Citizens who are just resigned or downright cynical, who feel they have no agency. You're the opposite of a spectator. You treat politics as a combat sport and roll up your sleeves to make change. Your book does not pull any punches at all and talks about how we have internalized the worst lessons of our opponents by catering to backbiting, loathing, and timidity of fear. So I would like to ask you, 98 days out from the US election, what progress are you seeing in that hard work of civic engagement? What will it take to have that leap of faith to rekindle vibrant democratic participation? Stacey. Well, first of all, Claire, thank you so much for having me back. And it's an honor to be here, particularly with my dear friend, Will Dobson who was the person who introduced me to the Salzburg seminars. When I joined you all in 2000, it was with the very sincere intention of building on the progress we'd made as a nation in voting rights. And my mission was to increase youth participation, to think about how we not only construct youth engagement at, in the act of voting, but how you consistently drive that through the work of participation and accountability. Unfortunately, what has happened in the 20 years since is that we saw the erosion of the Voting Rights Act, its evisceration by the Supreme Court in 2013, and we saw a resurgence of voter suppression that actually began in the wake of the 20, 2008 election. And I, I say all that to say that where we stand today is that we are in a battle for democracy in America. It is a fragile institution we often forget that democracy is a thought experiment, that we are going to collectively pool our resources, our economy, and our 
ingenuity to maintain the system that says that we will all be heard. We may not all win, but we will all at least be able to share our vision for what we will become. But as we've seen happen around the world, the fragility of democracy has been put into sharp relief by the rise of authoritarian populist, but also by, I think, a denigration of the value of participation. I am more partisan than most, and I will tell you that what I've witnessed over the last 20 years, and I would say it's happened over the last 40, has been an erosion of the value of government, the value of civic participation by the cynicism that says that government's not worth it. We, you know, someone who began my political career actually working as a lawyer for politicians, what I found so often was this denigration of bureaucracy as an unnecessary evil and unnecessary intrusion. And when you start to undermine the systems of delivery of service, you by its nature start to undermine the notion of collective participation, which is the core of democracy. And so where we stand today is that we're facing an election where the three questions we're asking are one, do we intend to continue to be a democracy? Do we intend to have a central state where we have a president who is actually beholden to and answerable to the people? Or will we have one who is only answerable to a small minority that happens to hold governance power or political power? Two, will we allow citizens to be heard? Voter suppression is the act of preventing or discouraging people who are eligible for participation, blocking them from doing so. And we have seen the expansion of voter suppression over the last decade in ways that really do undermine the, the notion that we want people to be in our sphere, that we want them to be heard. And third, we are in the midst of a census in the United States, which is not simply the counting of people, but it is the story of what America is to become. And it's how we allocate the resources to sustain our democracy, but also the political power to build the next decade of democracy. And unfortunately, we are watching an attempt to weaponize the census, to undermine the participation of communities of color, and to erase the story of diversity that is America. And so I'm, I'm neither hopeful nor despondent. I am an ameliorist. I believe that the glass is half full. It's just probably poisoned. And so our job is to do our best to mitigate the harms of voter suppression, to lift up the call to protect the census, and more than anything, to have an active and engaged electorate that can decide the direction of our democracy, whether we're going to continue to move deeper into democracy or start to shift, unfortunately, away from that system of government. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So those are three really clear fault lines and calls to action you've identified. But isn't there a paradox around this issue of the time it takes? You know, you chose the title for your book, Our Time Is Now, and you've highlighted very concrete reasons for absolute urgency, not least the timing of the census and the need to get it right now. Um, at the same time, we all know that we're juggling with systemic complexity. These failures run deep, they run broad. What would you see as the critical levers to take action right now to try and harness that intentionality and tie it into the urgency you just expressed? The, there's a debate happening in the United States right now over the COVID response. And the macro conversation that is taking place is one of how we deploy resources to individual citizens, individuals living in, our, in, our, in the United States who need aid surviving this uh, disaster. We have both a public health crisis and an economic collapse. But two substrates of the debate of this legislation, one is a substrate that looks at how we actually shore up our elections. The HEROES Act, which was passed by the House two months ago, indicates and takes from national experts, we need about $3.6 billion infused into our elections infrastructure if we are to have competitive elections in November. We know that our states are cash strapped, that they have been losing money, that they do not have the capacity to meet the demand for voting at this moment because part of the challenge is we need people who can vote by mail. That is the safest way to vote. Uh, because we are seeing surges in the virus and we're still in the first wave, we know that by November the second wave will have hit and it is not, it is not feasible that we can have a fully in-person 
election. And we have seen time and again during our primaries that nearly half the population wants to vote by mail. And so we have to build the infrastructure to scale up what is absolutely viable, but cannot be delivered unless we get the resources. But the second substrate is the census. We have watched in the last week, the president has announced an executive memo that is designed to terrify the undocumented from participation and in the larger penumbra would actually affect any immigrant family that's of mixed documentation. That is intended to actually cut into participation, knowing that right now, black and Latino families are behind by between 12 and uh, I think 12 and 14 percent. Native Americans are behind by 25 percent in participation in the counting of the census. And so if you terrify people out of participation, and then secondarily, what they're attempting to use this COVID relief package to do is to speed up the process, to move quickly through the census and artificially truncate it. That means that those communities that are far behind now will far further behind, in part because the way we get them to participate is called the non-response follow-up period. And if you truncate that period, there is a statistical tool called imputation that allows you to guess who didn't respond. And typically those guesses are wrong. And so what I would say the urgent, the reason this urgency exists is that Congress is going to act in the next few weeks. They are going to have to do a new infusion of capital into our government. They're going to have to infuse capital into our states. They're going to have to deliver resources to our people. But we can't allow the, the major conversation of those resources to overshadow the very legitimate arguments that we have to have an election that can be delivered in November. At the same time, we have to have a census that is delivered no earlier than October 31st and is not artificially truncated to essentially fudge the numbers and tell a lie about what America looks like. Yeah, we've seen in countries around the world how with because of the COVID crisis, money can be made available for what in the heat of the moment is valued. Who are you now to engage with this so that the money goes into, as you said, creating a viable and equitable infrastructure to support the democracy in November? So this is a bipartisan call. Democracy oh. is not partisan. The machinery of democracy should work regardless of who's voting. Our selections are partisan, but our elections should not be. And I call to, uh, my call to arms is that we have watched nation states around the world that have been beset by COVID respond and still manage to hold elections. I look at what President Moon was able to do in South Korea. They were able to hold an election that was the highest turnout since the 1990s. And so there is no argument that this cannot be done. The will to do it is what we are missing, not the capacity to do it. And so it is absolutely a call to the minority, the majority understand that when you break the machinery of democracy, you break it for everyone. That is one of the reasons we have seen in these primaries, while Democratic secretaries of state and governors have been pushing for expansion of vote by mail, so too have Republicans. In fact, the Secretary of State of Kentucky Mitch McConnell's home state actually defied the edict from the president and sent out applications encouraging people to participate and vote by mail. And so we have to remember that the stories we tell of our nation have to be told about all of us. Uh, similarly, when it comes to the census, we know that Florida stands to lose 5.5, sorry, Texas will lose $5.5 .5 billion if an undercount occurs among just the undocumented. For Florida, that's roughly 3.3 billion. Georgia, it's 1.3 billion. These are all states that have Republican senators who should understand that the loss of that money every single year decimates their intentions for their state's economy and their intentions for their constituents. And so my argument is that we need Democrats, Republicans, and independents to step forward and to actually remember that we can fight in the battlefield of ideas without undermining the machinery that makes democracy operative. Yeah, so that, that's a, a resonating call for both enlightened self and collective interest and the incentives to really have both sides come together to get the infrastructure in place. I wanted just to pick up on this question of, of boldness and taking the long view. Um, in the way you write, you talk a lot about the inspiration of your own family and the work ethic. And we're all conscious that this is a time when the US is mourning one of its civic rights role models um, in John Lewis. Um, 
I would like to have you just talk briefly about the issue of courage and breaking through those visible and invisible barriers that is required now. And then I'm going to bring in Will to talk further about this issue of corrosion of democracy from within. I, I have had the, the deep privilege of not only being able to call John Lewis my congressman, I was you know, just privileged to call him my friend. Each time I've engaged in an act of uh, civic, in, you know, civic participation, whether it was starting the New Georgia Project to register communities of color, fair fight to fight back against voter suppression, fair count to create uh, a very strong push for participation in the census among communities of color and other hard to count communities, John Lewis was always there. And not simply as an act of participation, but as an act of persistence. This is a man whose life was organized around the fundamental belief in the equality of humanity and that that equality would not occur but for courage, but for bravery. But he would never call it that. He believed it was duty. He believed he, his obligation as an American, his patriotism demanded that he do everything in his power to not simply speak to the benefits that would Accrue, accrue to him through his efforts, but he's always stepped into spaces where others needed to hear him, whether it was sitting on those steps holding essentially a sit-in when the Pulse nightclub debacle occurred, the work that he did to expand access for the LGBTQ community, the work that he has done on international scale demanding that the United States actually adhere to its theory of you know, humanity and engagement, John Lewis believed that the success of others was his success. And it is a courageous act to know that you may not directly benefit from behavior, but that does not absolve you of your responsibility to engage. And that is why he is not only an American hero, he is an international, uh, I believe, avatar for good. Yep. Well, you seamlessly linked the US domestic situation with the international stage. And I want to bring in Will now, who is really an expert working on modern authoritarianism. But for this conversation, Will, I'm particularly interested to ask you, linking to what Stacey has said, what's got you most worried at the moment? And in particular, this idea of the crumbling of the democratic infrastructure and what it's going to take to turn that tide around. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, and also now I find myself in the least enviable position that any speaker can ever be in, which is to follow Stacey Abrams. Uh, so also thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I thought the question that you posed for this entire, for this entire conversation about whether democracy is becoming a spectator sport was a fantastic one because it get, kind of gets right at the point um, of the goal for, from the other side. And that is that the goal for any authoritarian is to make politics, democracy, in whatever form it takes, a spectator sport. The notion is that ideally you can achieve some level of collective apathy. Uh, I mean, we, there's a concept of performance legitimacy you'll hear in political science literature where it is best if the regime can succeed on its merits and actually people want to continue to buy into the system as it exists. But if that fails, as the backdrop, it is apathy. It is an acceptance to the grinding status quo. And if, if that can be achieved, then a ruling party can feel can sleep well at night, can feel safe, and and so that in many ways is, is this is the tension, um, and so but your specific question is what worries me the most, and what worries me the most is you're right in your opening comments about the fact that democracy is straining and it's straining in a way that we haven't seen in quite some time. And it's straining for many reasons. Uh, it's still rebounding from the Great Recession. Uh, it is faced with new and much more robust threats uh, in the form of a more muscular and assertive China, uh, a much more adventuresome Russia, and others who are trying to advance authoritarianism globally. Uh, that's all true. Um, but I would say that actually the greater threat actually comes internally uh, within liberal democracies right now, uh, and that's in the form of populism. Um, you know, it's 
populism that um, promises something and achieves its goal through the ballot box. It, it, it arrives, you know, it arrives in disguise, so to speak, as one thing, as a promise to social ills. But once in power, its goal is very much to dismantle the very liberal institutions and norms that allowed for its rise in the first place. It's an internal leveler of democracy in that way. And what we, and unfortunately, this is not a phenomenon that is, that is regionally located. It is global. Um, we're seeing this in Europe, we're seeing this in the Americas, we're seeing this in Asia, Africa, so on. And it has many different sources, although it has this commonality in sort of the playbook that you see. And in some cases, you know, I think of the U.S. and, and Europe, it's been the politicization of social resentment. It has been the aftermath of the Great Recession and the feeling of people being left behind that at least provided a fertile field for, for populists to, to seize. But we, a lot of times we don't think about other parts of the world, which are also seeing a rise of authoritarian populism. And it's not the same story that's at work. Uh, it is in many ways the, the rollback of what we call the third wave of democracies. Those democracies that came in, in this great birth from 1990 up until about 2005. And these are new democracies. And we're seeing a shift in their politics towards a greater turn towards authoritarianism, in part because some of these very governments have failed to be able to deliver on the basic things that their people most wanted, social services, inequality addressed, um, crime, basic, basic ma matters of governance that frankly, are difficult anywhere, but are particularly difficult for those that are under-resourced and are very much at the beginning of their democratic experiment. And so we see that type of populism rising in other parts of the world. So what we have then is something that's very malleable, something that can travel, and yet at the same time is a threat within our own house. Um, and so I think in that way, if you were to ask me, you know, what do I worry more about? Do I worry more about sort of the, the election interference of foreign powers or do I worry about you know, growing alliances between authoritarian capitals? The answer is no. I actually worry much more about the internal rise of populism um, in the US and around the world. Uh, and when we spoke before, you talked about this sort of self-doubt, this indecision about how do we feel about those democracies. I want to have Stacey respond to you now before we turn to our provocateurs and think in particular about that reappropriation of democracy to craft it for what we need it to deliver, especially for those who are the most fragile in our societies. Stacey. Yes. Perfect. I, if I if I tie together Will's comment and, and your question, I think the challenge we face it goes to the, the essential question or issue that Will raised, which is apathy, and I think apathy coupled with despair. Often populism rises in part by trampling on minority rights. It creates this sense of otherness, and that otherness is then followed by either a political violence or an actual violence against those communities. And we are seeing this play out around the world, and, and if you bring it to the United States, there is an absolute political violence inherent in voter suppression. When you tell communities that the only way you can achieve your goal of ending structural racism, of mitigating systemic inequities, of tackling police brutality or environmental racism, you add the ism that you, you're, you're concerned about, when you're told that your only methodology is participation in democracy through the act of voting, and then you see these superstructures built to not only impede it, but then to convince you that it's not worth the attempt. That dynamic has more than an individualized effect. Why it is so pernicious is that it begins to convince entire communities that their engagement is not valued, and more importantly, that it is more dangerous to participate than it is to sit idly by. That is one of the reasons we are seeing, particularly among young people, this resistance to the notion of go vote as the response to the protests that we see. And uh, you know, I've been very insistent upon admonishing my colleagues to say that go vote is not an answer if you do not address the underlying 
concern that either your vote cannot happen or that your vote when it occurs is not fully counted. And so we have to be very intentional, both in our democracy and to, to Will's point about nascent democracies that are building their capacity in the wake of populists who do their best to undermine this theory of engagement. We have to say that voting is not an act in and of itself that solves problems. It is a process. And if you think about voting as a process, it is an activity that takes place every year at various levels of government, but the interstitial moments are just as important, showing up, holding people accountable, calling on your legislators, doing the work that protest demands, which is keeping the conversation front and center. As we think about almost every one of the most recent uprisings around the world, where minority rights have been at the center of pushing for democratic expansion, or at least realization of democratic norms, it has been protest coupled with the ability to then translate that into voting power that has been successful. And when those two things are separated, and when one necessarily diminishes the capacity of the other, that's when we see the fragility of democracy really start to, to present itself and we see democracy start to crumble. Absolutely. It's a great moment to bring in um, the first of our three provocateurs now. Uh, all three are anything but apathetic and they're coming from very different spaces of difference or otherness in their life paths. So I'm going to turn to Chloe for two to three minutes of quick points. And just as a re recap, Chloe is working at the city level in Memphis to tackle systemic barriers to that full participation in society. Chloe, over to you. Hello, thank you for having me. And I want to start off by saying very quickly to Maria, Henry, Will, and Stacey, thank you for what you do. And also, you know, in thinking of how much work this requires of all of us, I, my sincerest hope is that you also receive some of the goodness that you work to put out in the world. What is the role of collective apathy and where does it come from? And even thinking of democracy as a thought experiment, to me, it all drills back down to the why of things like why does government matter? What is it that we're searching for as a people? And what do our social contracts say we are worth? And I think that um, these conversations are only as good as the notion of understanding we get about human behavior. And when we realize that so much of why any of this matters is the fact that life is temporary and life is finite, you start to get to the understanding of why fears exist, of how things such as fear mongering can incite social divisions or the massive rise of nationalism or populism or authoritarianism has been so successful by people and specifically those in power preying upon our deepest fears of being impermanent. And so when I think through those things and I think through, you know, why does democracy matter? Democracy is important because there's some sort of intrinsic sacredness to human experience. And when we lose sight of that and get so caught up in you know, the processes of the systems and you lose the human aspect, you lose the understanding of why does apathy come up? It's when people are systemically shown that they do not, or their life is not as valued as someone else's. And so to me, one of the responses to this is when we have seen so many pandemics that have really shown a flashlight into the inequities that exist, this is a time, a chance of a lifetime to explicitly to commit to human dignity, to reframe our collective vision to say, not just that we want a government to work, but that the role of government is to care for each of its residents in a way that, yes, secures their safety, yes, shows them that they matter, but also allows people to enjoy a real well-being that is not fueled by consumerism, but rather is fueled by contentment. And so I think that there is this really large, and when I say spiritual, I don't mean religious, I mean a really large spiritual awakening that's happening that um, has always bubbled under the surface of we exist in inequality that is very uncomfortable to so many of us. And the response has been fear, which has created, again, these kind of disparate experiences for different communities. Great. Thank you. So, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Chloe. I'm going to, I'm going to stop you yeah, there, but yeah. we'll be coming back and bringing these points together. Henry, okay. let me bring you in for your provocation. I will uh, uh, thank just just like just repeating everybody else. Just thank you so much for having me here and for uh, sharing this space with me. Um, well, I'm I'm here speaking as someone who was born in China, um, raised in the States, and is now married to a woman from Hong Kong. Uh, 
Um, in other words, I am a person with roots in all three places, one where democracy is not part of the vocabulary at all, you can't even search for it on the internet, one where democracy is very much a part of the rhetoric, but as far as, as long as I can remember, it has always felt more like an oligarchy, and one where just as recently as last month, democracy was forcibly wiped off the slate, it was removed from the table, such that people who are now going out to the streets to protest at the risk of their own lives are holding up uh, protest signs that are simply blank sheets of paper. Um, and I want to linger on that last image because I think it speaks a lot to some of the things that Stacy mentioned, um, talking about democracy as a thought experiment um, and democracy as something where it's not about necessarily all of us winning, um, whatever that means, but uh, about having an opportunity to put your vision or your, um, your voice out there. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, the closest I've ever come to experiencing whatever it is we talk about when we talk about democracy has been out on the streets. Um, and I'm talking particularly about the moments when protests uh, reach some kind of trans transformative turning point, when it's not just about the, relation the adversarial relationship to power, when it's not just about um, anger and indignity, but when it, gets, uh, when it becomes so prolonged that it really becomes about how do we look at each other and how do we figure out how to organize this, how do we care for one another? And the relationship really becomes about um, a relationship of care, um, a relationship of looking at each other's suffering. Um, and this speaks in some ways to, to what Chloe was saying about this spiritual awakening as well. Um, I, I think in, in uh, just the, the last couple of months, you can think of Seattle. Um, last year, I would think of Mauna Kea and the cultural uh, protocols there. Uh, last year also, I would think about Hong Kong and how um, where uh, in, in some ways you could say that the despair has been uh, so much a part of the bottom line that people have pushed beyond it already. And last year before COVID, people in the streets were already developing their own economy. And so that image of the, the blank sheet of paper on one hand, when we think of protests, it's about what's been taken away. It's about what's been erased. But on the other hand, what I'm really interested in and what is uh, so motivating and inspiring to me is thinking about um, the, the potential of it, the, the blank sheet as, uh, as infinite capacity. I'll, I'll, I'll end there. It's a really interesting comparison between powerlessness, um, or powerfulness at a moment where technically one is powerless and also these comments about getting beyond the transactional, this idea of winners and losers. So talking of power, let's turn now to Maria who has the insider experience of the world of big tech, um, really from the inside for more than 20 years, but has chosen a completely different way to challenge the way we think about those power paradigms. Maria, over to you. So what I've got to say here is that big tech is a big part of the problem. Um, its business model and its global monopolies, it's basically incompatible with democracy. So with big tech, it fuels disinformation, electoral interference and micro-targeting. And each of those things is injuring our democracy. And the big tech business model that we have is called ad tech. It's advertising technology. And big tech has told us a big lie, which is that the only way we can have what the internet does for us is if we support it by advertising. And that's a bit like saying, um, you know, the only way you can have broccoli and lemon pie and everything that is delicious is if you eat it in a pill that is surrounded by arsenic. And obviously that's just silly and wrong. There are so many different ways to do the internet and um, big tech has just, just picked the one that made the most money that emerged in the early 2000s. But ad tech isn't just a lie and it isn't just this historically contingent choice. It's um, corrosive of democracy. Basically, ad tech favors right-wing ideas and it favors right-wing power structures and right-wing organizational methods. Um, think of the three-line um, micro-targeted um, ads, lock her up, take back control, make America great again. Those are like micro-narratives that spread so easily on social media because social media is based on engagement or I think more accurately on enragement. That is the business model of social media. It's those kind of micro-narratives that pull people apart. Those micro-narratives are very, very good in a world where you just have elections to decide who the state is going to hurt, not who the state is going to help. Micro-narratives are very good at deciding who's the other, who's different, who's on the outside, who is on the 49% losing side, who, we're gonna, who the state is going to hurt or injure or even kill with complete impunity. 
But the internet has another story, and that is a story of it's a public good, and we know how to provide those things. It's utility. It's, um, it's, it's a natural monopoly, and we have ways to provide those things for ourselves. So I would say um, there are alternatives. Big tech tries to tell us there are no alternatives to its model, but that's rubbish. Um, there are longer stories and deeper stories that we use to help us imagine the future. And those are stories like the story of the biblical story of Exodus, like as that help us to imagine the promised land, promised land narratives like to Amanda Ngozi Adichie's Half of Yellow Sun, stories that basically tell us um, when it's time to get out. And then we have stories called utopias that tell us what the promised land is going to look like when we get there. Because the thing about stories is they, um, they're not just thought experiments like democracy, they're feeling experiments and they help us to find other people. Um, that wasn't me. But it's me. I'm on a timer. I did my own timer. Well, it <laughs> was, that was an example of democracy in action um, because you got there just before I did. It was utterly non-transactional. But it gives me the perfect moment to thank the provocateurs for genuinely throwing very different views in and to turn back to Stacey to pick up on things that have caught the attention, things you radically disagree with, or things where you'd love to deepen the conversation. Stacey. I hold no radical disagreement with anyone. I, I think the weaving together of Chloe's notion of the intrinsic value of how we think about our humanity and how that humanity is lived in a democracy, linking that with Henry's very, I think, visual narrative about the, the infinite capacity signaled by that white sheet of paper, that blank sheet of paper. And you know, when you connect that to Maria's commentary about how we have seen big tech or ad tech try to inscribe on that paper a limiting set of values of who we are and to perform an erasure of Chloe's notion of the intrinsic value by setting a value. I, I wrap those things together as a, you know, a cautionary tale. We have to remember that, again, we are participants and, and thus the constructors of democracy. And those of us who are privileged to live in nation states that hew to the notion of democracy, the obligation to, for its preservation is on us. There's a framing that I, I, I like that says that you know, in the United States, every four years, we are engaged in the peaceful overthrow of government, if we so choose. And that urgency accelerates when you find yourself faced with leadership that is holding on to power, not through the persuasive notion of their ideas or their delivery of services to the people, but through pushing communities out of participation and often out of the conversation through fairly aggressive means. One of the reasons voter suppression is so insidious in the United States is that it, it no longer looks like, and I talk about this in, in the book, it no longer has the frame of Jim Crow laws or guns and dogs. It is this labyrinth of rules. And one of the ways that democracy you know, sp spins itself out is that it creates sets of rules to help organize all of these people who want to be participatory. And the moment those rules are used not to guide, but to strangle access, to limit engagement, to artificially constrain their, their, their activation, that is when we start to see the demise of democracy. And one piece that Will and I have been in these conversations a, a lot lately, as someone who is domestically grounded, but internationally aware, watching this play out with Brazil and Bolsonaro, watching what happened in Turkey with Erdogan, watching Modi and his behavior, uh, looking to what's happening in the Philippines with Duterte, we watch it play out in, in different speeds, but there's a through line that we cannot ignore is, has come to America. And while Donald Trump is symptomatic of this through line, he is not the only harbinger. And so I argue that our participation in democracy has to deepen. And, and when Henry you know, sort of situated himself in China, the United States, and Hong Kong, I situate myself in the Deep South, in, in Georgia, in the Deep South, and in the United States. And 
the, the gradations of democracy that I have experienced depending on where I was located and that exists depending on which state I happen to pick as my locus, that speaks to the erosion of our democracy that my, my engagement as a citizen varies widely and, and unfortunately too dramatically depending on whether I'm living in Georgia, Oregon, or Wisconsin. We should not have so many gradations of access simply based on crossing state borders. And that, no that notion undermines the nature of what a democracy in America should look like. Yeah, and the whole notion of universality, which we often tend to associate with what we think democracy stands for. Will, let me bring you in here and feel free to take, uh, to agree, disagree, or throw in a completely different perspective on what you've been hearing. Um, a somewhat more hopeful example or story in all of this. Um, and, you know, the, the one that comes to mind for me right now um, is the example of Taiwan. Um, Taiwan held elections in January. And it really can't be stressed enough uh, to the crucible that Taiwanese democracy just passed through. Uh, if we think about the sort of stress that's being placed on democracies as they try to live their experiment, um, Taiwan is right there on the front lines. Um, the levels of disinformation, propaganda, influence operations, just hard cash that was pumped into those elections by an authoritarian power right out right across the strait in china was incredible and it was done with the intent of swinging the election and one thing you immediately learn is that over 25 years of trying to do this beijing still doesn't understand democratic politics very well because it blew up in their face in a dramatic way and it also blew up because the taiwanese people were looking at examples around the world they were to henry's point looking at the events of 2019 in hong kong and thinking to themselves do we want that to be our future? Should we, can we trust promises from a political party that says greater um, connection with the mainland is in our, in, our, in our interest? And so through all these pressures, nevertheless, you had an election with incredible turnout, tremendous turnout. And you had an incumbent who had stood up to the mainland who won with 57% of the vote. And I should say she won with an 18 point margin against her opponent who was putting forward a Beijing backed populist agenda. So the point is that in, in, you know, in, in places like Taiwan and there are other places we can look to as well, you can see very positive signs of what democracy is capable of producing and how it can be resilient in its own right. And we don't talk a lot these days about democratic resilience, but it does exist and it happened through participation. So how does one spread that resilience? Um, Stacey, you've given the very concrete examples of the immediate time sensitive challenges that are there. What examples are you seeing of that resilience being taken up in the US and in a sense the movement building for change despite these differences between, as you said, the state boundaries and so on? There are groups that have been proliferating around the country starting in 2008, but of course accelerating in, 20, accelerating in 2016, I, I look to groups like Woke Vote that began in Alabama. They are not simply engaging voters, they have taken on this fellowship program of building young leaders, particularly from communities and in spaces where they're not expected to be leaders in our politics. I look at Block in Wisconsin, which has taken a very hyper-local approach to participation in democracy. And one of their, their novel programs is that the block participants take elected officials on a tour of community where the elected officials are not allowed to speak. They simply have to experience. And it transforms, I think, not only the elected official, but being the guide deepens the understanding of community and recognizing the role it has to play in making participation real. But I also think about the protest, uh, the protests that are happening in Seattle and in Portland, but also the protests that have continued to foment across the country and groups watching our sports uh, leaders, for example, the WNBA wearing their jerseys, everyone emblazoned with the name Breonna Taylor uh, mm -hmm. to signify the importance of not allowing this division between 
our pleasure and our purpose. Uh, the pleasure of watching sports, the pleasure of engagement, but the purpose of demanding that their humanity doesn't cease to exist when they step on the court and it doesn't get amplified when they, when they leave the court. And so I think we are watching the communalization of participation in these various facets of our, of our, of our state. And we are seeing this replicated around the world where the arts have always been one of the vehicles for participation and engagement. Sports can be that. I mean, Juan Carlos, John, John Carlos and in the um, 68 Olympics is one of those moments where we recognize that participation takes on its deepest meaning when we take the idea of democracy being an act and turn it into being a lifestyle. And participation in that lifestyle means this constant engagement. Do you think that schools are reinforcing those messages? How much engagement are you having with, um, with schools and with the, the educators of the next generation in terms of that new way of thinking about duty, of leadership, of collective action for a new social contract? Unfortunately, in the United States, civic education has been diminished, if not erased. The push towards testing and this memorization notion of how we prove our learning in our public school system has unfortunately edged out the more pedestrian and I would say more necessary notions of duty, of democracy, of understanding how things work. Uh, there's a young man, uh, a young uh, hip hop artist out of Ohio that I like to reference named Yellow Pain, who did this extraordinary music video where he actually deconstructs the questions of why the most affected communities do not vote and then takes them to task and explains how the process works. And he does it, in, it's a four minute video, but his ability to explain the civic intersectionality of criminal justice reform, of environmental justice, and of the presidency, state, and local government is a phenomenon. And what's so amazing to me about it is that he was self-taught. This was not something he learned in school. And part of his mission and his message is that so often the, you know, gen, the tail end of Gen X, all of Gen Y, and until we change, all of Gen Z enters this democracy without necessarily having the tools to understand how to make it work or completely redesigns those tools for a new generation. But it's a good moment for me to bring in um, a couple of questions which our great team has picked out from the extremely lively chat box. Um, so this question is, Americans have always put more value into the individual rather than the collective, which is one of the reasons um, our response to the pandemic has failed so badly. Is this a result of a uniquely American democracy or an effort to dismantle it. Um, Stacey and Will, let me give you a chance to come in on that one. Will, I will defer to you. Will. Okay, um, it's a great question. Um, I think though that, you know, I, I, I would agree with part of the premise of the question, which is that of course, the United States has always had this priority uh, for individual rights, and it's been something that's been, you know, it's it's into the core of, of our political fabric. Um, but I think where I think that it, it's not ultimately, it doesn't have sufficient explanatory power uh, to explain the response to the pandemic. And you can say that because I think you look at the varied response across the United States. Um, we have a federal system, and so what that has allowed for is for intensely different responses uh, to this crisis. Now, there's no question that um, having a broader, more, more clear, directed, early, efficient national response could have been incredibly effective across areas, particularly those that might have been reluctant to move quickly. But then you have states like Rhode Island, or you have states like Vermont or Connecticut um, that have responded uh, in a way that is really in many ways sort of on par with what we see when we think about an Iceland or a New Zealand or a Taiwan in, in terms of really listening to public health experts in trying to address a public health emergency. So. To me, it's, this is actually more a product of our current politics than it is something that is an intrinsic um, frailty of liberal democracy in the United States. 
or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's also, of course, the COVID, the multiple impacts of COVID are a huge threat multiplier. We've heard several times across this conversation the critical importance of leadership in democratic systems to meet the needs of public services. And yet we've seen in many parts of the US a serial failure that will leave those who are already most vulnerable doubly or triply exposed um, by this multiple pandemic in a way. Stacey, do you want to come in at that, or Will, come back in. Well, I mean, I think that's exactly right. And I would just add to that, the diversity can extend itself beyond democracies itself to authoritarian regimes. You've seen authoritarian regimes that have responded effectively and those that have not. So for every Iran, there's a Vietnam, which did listen to public health experts and responded in a very effective way quickly. So we've been having this debate, I think early on in March and April, and to some degree it goes forward as to which type of political system responds better. In fact, it's missing the point. Uh, they're, they're nimble enough too. It's how do they, and when we see any commonality at all, it's a commonality in the failure, which is typically one that's directed by populism, which thrives on polarizing. It thrives on a, a, a belief that there's an us and a them. And it can only succeed if it remains divisive, which is exactly what you don't need in trying to fight a pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Stacey, do you want to come on in there? Or do you want me to carry on with the questions? Get to the next question. I think it's been fully answered. Okay, lovely. Um, so the next question, I spend a lot of time speaking about climate change and the future in general with my 30-ish children. I mean, my age 30-ish children, not 30 children. They perceive addressing climate change as being far more pressing than democracy. How should I respond? Stacey, I'm going to pass to you then and then bring in our provocateurs as well. We have seen in real time the direct connection between democracy and climate action. Under President Obama, we entered the Paris Agreement. We took dramatic steps to increase the United States participation, but also to increase international commitment to addressing climate change. When, we, when there was a change of guard, Donald Trump immediately worked to rescind almost every moment of agreement. He has weakened our participation in not only addressing climate action internationally, but he has made it harder for those of goodwill to do the work here in the United States. Take, for example, his you know, attempt to undermine the capacity of the state of California to implement standards that push us closer to climate action. That is a, that is a direct result of democracy. And if you think about the voter suppression that existed in the United States in 2016 and the role that it had in the interference with electing our leaders, Full participation in our democracy and the ability to participate if you so choose is directly linked to climate action because unless we elect leaders who are willing to not only create change but to elect leaders who are willing to sustain that change, then we will not see climate action in the United States at a sustainable or more importantly an efficacious level. The, the mm -hmm. secondary part of it is that we have to remember that it's not just about democracy at the presidential level. It's also about democracy at the state and local level. Many of the choices made in the United States that sustains our climate in action, that suborns environmental injustice, begins at the state and local level. And so we have to do the work of making certain that our democratic engagement isn't so focused on our federal level that we ignore and in fact, uh, in, we empower the local and state elected officials to do nothing worse to do harm. Mm -hmm. I, Henry, I'd be, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but I'd be interested to hear your views in this area because there is some discussion, especially around issues of climate and environmental action, that a strong government that doesn't have to pander to electorates can actually get a lot more results done more quickly. And this is a very interesting area of international debate at the moment. Do you want to share a few thoughts on that, with, particularly with the China and Hong Kong Chinese experience you touched on? Well, I, I might somewhat go around the question a little bit just to say that the thing that stands out for me um, thinking about this is unity um, or, or sort of the, the unity of uh, a basically a universal crisis. Um, and that, uh, to, I think that has parallels in what I was talking about earlier with protest um, and the way that when you have a lot of people out on the streets um, and it goes beyond just thinking about 
the, the outcome or the, the next step or where are we marching to next? When you think about that, this is actually an existential crisis that we're all in. It changes the conversation. It changes the nature of the relationship. It changes what, what you, Claire, were describing as transactional. Um, and it allows for a different kind of conversation. It allows for um, a different way of approaching things um, together. I, I don't mean to use like the sort of senti the sentimental rhetoric of we're all in this together and, and we all have this common enemy. Um, but I think there there is something very powerful about this moment as we are um, as we have to look beyond um, sort of the 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 boundaries and the constructs of the nation state and and all of these um, these kind of this this ideological infrastructure that we have taken for granted but was really fabricated um, after especially after World War II because we're looking at something that requires us to engage with. The world with our the fact of our existence um, in a different way, and it goes beyond politics. And I think that's that's what can be very galvanizing and is very powerful about it, um, because it brings us down necessarily to a, a deeply human level. Mm -hmm. Well, as my colleague know, my colleagues know, deeply human is my favorite way of describing Salzburg Global Seminar and the way that we try to be tough on the issues but kind on each other. In the interest of listening, because we've heard a lot of emphasis on that, I'm going to bring in another question. And I recognize for everybody on the line that we're wetting appetites and we're only just beginning to scrape the surface. All these ideas are being captured for future debates in our designs on the future series. So this question is about education. Um, and it says, with very large global free learning platforms that can allow anybody to study anything, um, anywhere, in any language, is it time that we introduce mandatory education prior to voting? With these free platforms, we can now ask voters to make clear that they know the policy positions before they vote and make sure they don't vote on personality alone. Now, I'm not sure if that goes to the utopia or dystopia that Maria was talking about, but I'd like to have uh, Stacey's views and then bring in Chloe, who's working on equity in early childhood education in Memphis. Stacey. I, I appreciate the intention of the question, but I think it presumes that personality and other identity related capacities aren't necessary information to have in making a decision about voting. Having served as an elected official, I can tell you that what I know about a topic is hard to tease out in an online seminar. But what I can tell you about who I am and how I think is typically more dispositive of how I will vote and how I will act. I do believe that we want to encourage and engage and expand access to information. Uh, the work that I did with voter registration among communities of color, we did some deep. My communities of color were so reticent to register and even vote in the 2008 election in the United States. And what we found is that fear of making a mistake is one of the chief impediments to participation. These are communities, either native born African Americans or communities of immigrants who fear making mistakes and fear that by choosing the wrong person, they are somehow going to undermine the very little that they enjoy as a perquisite of being a citizen. And so I believe expanded education, expanded access to information, the utility of engagement in that way is absolutely necessary. But I, I would push back against this notion that people simply make decisions on personality. What those personalities tend to signal are commonalities for people. They believe, I mean, the reason populists are so effective, they speak to an innate need to push against authority. And they tend to win by being a counterweight to the tradition of the presentation of a, of a politician. And so I, I think that there is utility to expanding access to information. I disagree with the notion of making it mandatory. And I would encourage us to expand our thinking of how people make their choices. Uh, I, I believe in identity politics because I believe that it is critical that we have representatives who actually represent and understand our existence and are working to remove barriers to our success. And I know that's not necessarily the, the question raised by the questioner, but I do think it's an important uh, narrative to add to that conversation. Absolutely. Um, Chloe, do you want to come in with a couple of thoughts from the perspective of the city level where you're really focusing very explicitly on educate equity and, and agency 
in through education? Yeah, so I, w I would say that um, to me, systems and participation um, have a serious flaw when um, people aren't given the tools to participate at the same level. And so what I mean by that is um, part of the design process of the work that um, we got to lead was asking folks who are residents in the community not only what they want, but showing them the whole landscape of what was possible. And I think sometimes what happens, and I know this is a micro example, but sometimes when people are in the social impact world and want to do um, maybe focus groups or you know get people's opinions to you know maybe co-design an initiative, something that they often leave off the table is that when you don't give the participants the tools to understand the full spectrum of what is possible, then oftentimes you create these unintentional cycles of what progress looks like because people haven't been given the space to know um, or to see what's fully possible. And a small example of this is um, in terms of when it comes to elections, I think one of the very interesting comments I've heard is that sometimes people will vote against their own self-interest um, and pref to prefer what a maybe a certain type of personality, which is what I think part of the question was asking about. And when I, when I think about, you know, people um, supposedly voting against their own self-interest, they are in their, in what is their um, logical choice that voting in what is of interest to them and what is in their interest because they, as Stacey was saying, can see something that they relate to, can um, assume that that person has their best interests at heart. And where I think sometimes there are missteps is when people, and this is a big failing on our education system is that we do not create folks, we do not give education um, experiences that offer social literacy. So we talk a lot about um, maybe mathematics or reading or these things that honestly are designed to create a workforce of factory laborers and has never been really reinterrogated or reimagined for a modern world. And so you have people who again have not been given the tools to fully participate in government, which is what democracy requires and are still saying that we have some kind of a democracy that functions, which to me is, is not true. So the recommendation of mandatory learning before voting, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with making it mandatory because I think oftentimes with policies um, disenfranchise the most marginalized of people, but I do think it is incredibly important to reinvent the education system so that the, the body of your country um, has all of the tools necessary to make the most informed decisions. Okay, so you, you're talking about this limitation of the spectrum, reminded me of what Maria was talking about when she talked about the, the uh, pernicious influence of ad tech in that way of actually limiting the, 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 the capacity of, of invention. And I'm going to pick up past to Maria with a very small part of a question just for a brief answer before we go back to Stacey to complete this webinar. And this questioner has said, there is an interesting tension between not feeling like your government represents you but being told by your government to create it through democracy. So how can societies constructively engage with this when public messaging is so circumscribed by the people who've benefited so far? Maria, just a couple of quick thoughts as you're with your science fiction writer uh, hat on, and then we'll go back to Stacey to wrap up. Um, yeah, I got into tech policy because I thought it was the most important thing because I'm interested in technology and all of the good things it can do. Now I am still in tech policy because I believe that technology is, and the, the particular business models it lives inside, is preventing us from doing the work of building coalitions, of um, telling stories, of sharing self-interest, of, of basically imagining the kinds of futures that we need to imagine for us to build coalitions and make political change. Um, so, so I kind of see that the, um, we're not going to fix democracy and we're not going to deal with climate change if we cannot come together in ways that allow us to um, have differences of opinion but ultimately be able to work constructively on what we agree on so so i think we have a structural problem in our tech and that's why um i would say we have to we have to sort out big tech we have to sort out the monopolies um in in a couple of days time there's going to be a hearing in Congress of the four big um, tech CEOs in the US. And they're gonna try and say two completely different things. One of those things is gonna be that you can't change us. If you change us, you won't have the internet. It will go away forever and everything will be terrible. Um, on the other hand, they're gonna try and say, um, 
we're not a monopoly. You don't need to regulate us like a monopoly. We're kind of just kind of, you know, people just trying to get along and run a business and trying to do the best that we can. And both of those things are not true. Tech is vitally important and it's undermining our ability to, to, do, to structurally do politics in a way that allows us to imagine collective futures. Um, so I would say, you know, when you look at, at how, do we, how, how do we find governments or make governments, you know, do public messaging that is useful, we have to, basically, we, we have to have better tools. And if the tools we have now are preventing us from building anything, then we need to get rid of those tools and build better tools. Which is the perfect moment to pass back to Stacey for her own closing thoughts or any particular takeaways that she has um, before I wrap up. So Stacey, just a few thoughts from your side um, as you absorb and react to all of this. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for engaging this conversation and thank you to Maria and Chloe, uh, Henry, and of course, to Will and to you, Claire, for provocative questions. The title of this conversation is, you know, is democracy becoming a spectator sport? I would say that the strong men in power in too many of our nations that claim democracy are indeed doing their best to force us out of participation, to ensure that they stay in power by discouraging people from voting, from engagement, from participation writ large. But no, democracy is not becoming a spectator sport because at the exact same time that they are surging, uh, to Will's point about us searching for moments of hope, we are seeing movements, not only in the United States, but around the world. People fighting for democracy, fighting for justice. People who are standing up and saying that this belongs to me, that this democracy is mine, and I will not let you take it from me. We know that in the United States, in South Korea, it's about stepping up to the ballot box and we have seen record turnout despite the twin instrumentalities of voter suppression and COVID-19. We know that in Poland, while we may not all be satisfied with the outcome, there was an engagement level that is worthy of noting. And we have to do our best to not only encourage, but to sustain that engagement in our democracies here and abroad. I know that under our current leadership, the United States has acted more like a spectator in global democracy. But one of the benefits of being in a democratic state, as I said earlier, is that we have the ability in each election to reset what we expect. That is not to say that we will solve every problem, but we know that the failure to engage, the decision to remain a spectator or to not fight back against suppression and oppression guarantees that democracy slips further away. And I, for one, refuse to let that be so. What a, what a fantastic way to wrap up with a reminder of that power of leadership, that power of sticking the course, the power of persistence, resilience, and collective action. Um, you've left me with 30 seconds, so be thankful, everybody. I'm not going to try to wrap this up. Um, just to say, this is the beginning. As Stacey said, we need a reset. Well, Salzburg is at the start of a set of inclusive conversations, and we'd love you to be very much part of those. We also have some very exciting work coming up around criminal justice reform, work around social and emotional learning, and some of these key building blocks that have been running through the whole of this conversation. So please watch our website and stay engaged and sign up to the newsletter to carry on with this. But we're going to be saving this chat and anybody who's interested in keeping up the engagement, you ain't seen nothing yet. So with that, uh, please join me virtually in thanking uh, Stacey Abrams, Will Dobson, our three wonderful provocateurs who really represent that diversity and openness of experience across the Salzburg Global Fellowship. Thank you to all of you for daring to be Zoom bees together um, in this world of crazy COVID uh, online madness. Um, we wish you great health and we thank you again for your time and your support in joining us today. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.